encourage you to open up your own and follow along if you haven't. I know God has something to say to us through the scripture this morning. And when there's something that you find important and you want to remember, your Bible is a great place to mark it for later. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us into the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land where none passes through, where no man dwells? And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I still contend with you, says the Lord, and with your children's children, I will contend. For cross to the coast of Cyprus and see, or send a cedar and examine with care, see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I'm enjoying reading through Jeremiah this month because I confess it has been a while since I've read through the book of Jeremiah. And it comes up now in the lectionary calendar, the traditional calendar of scripture readings for the church. So I thought this was a great excuse for all of us to read it together. It is, after all, the second largest book in the Bible. It's only second to Psalms. And so just by sheer quantity, it deserves our importance, right? But now that I've been reading into Jeremiah for a couple weeks, reading two to three chapters a day for my devotional reading, I am reminded that it is a bummer to read Jeremiah. <laughs> it is not happy material. And if you've been reading along with me, then maybe you've felt this too. There are a lot of passages in Jeremiah that will just drag you down. So, for example, while I was writing this sermon, one day, this was my devotional material. And when they ask you, where shall we go, you say to them, thus says the Lord, those who are for pestilence, to pestilence, and those who are for the sword, to the sword, and those who are for famine, to famine. And those who are for captivity to captivity. And from there, it continues into destroying and killing and the carcasses being carried away by dogs. Not exactly what I want to read before I go to sleep at night. It's a bummer. But it is a justified bummer because Jeremiah had his ministry during a pretty tough time. From 627 to BC to 587 BC, 50 years, Jeremiah preached on God's behalf. And this was the time when Israel, when God's people, were so disobedient that God took God's hands off and let the mighty empire of the Babylonians come sweeping in. Three waves of attacks came in starting in 597, and in 587, Babylon succeeded in taking Jerusalem and in destroying the temple, which meant that literally God no longer resided in the Holy Land. Jeremiah sounds like 
a bummer because the situation was a bummer. Things were really bad. And that's why over and over again in Jeremiah, we hear things like this. Lift your eyes up to the bare heights and see. Where have you not been laying with? By the wayside, you have been, you have sat awaiting lovers like an Arab in the wilderness. You have polluted the land with your vile harlotry. This has all left me feeling like I do not want to be on the receiving end of this. <coughs> Whatever it is that God's people did to get them this message preached, I don't want to do it. So what did God's people do that was so bad? What did God's people do that earned them a whole book full of this kind of material, condemning them and predicting their destruction? What did God's people do that we want to avoid doing? Today's scripture uses a metaphor to lay it out for us. In verse 13 of chapter 2, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So, to take it out of its poetry and make it very plain, here's pretty much how the metaphor works. It's as though God gave God's people pure, perfect water. Like a mountain stream, but even better, because we around here know that not every mountain stream is as clear as it looks, right? You never know what might have been upstream, some factory, some farmland. This, God's water, is like uh, living water that came straight out of the source. There's nothing upstream. It's like a, a mountain creek where you don't have to be afraid to take a cup and scoop right from it and drink it. It is fresh and ever-flowing and perfect. But God's people are drinking that water. They have turned from God's eternal water and picked up this. It's like they've dug a well for themselves. And it wasn't even a good well. They dug this well, and then the well house they built, the, the sides cracked and dirt kind of leaked in. And I mean, it's just dirt, and most people still drink it anyway because we think it's okay. But a few people, Jeremiah maybe, are saying, that stuff's going to get you sick. Why are you drinking this when God has given you that? In chapter 2, in the verses that we read for today, it doesn't take it all the way home. So here's how it goes in the distance. God's people have turned from God, the source of eternal living water, and turned toward gods. They have turned from God with a capital G and turned toward gods with a lowercase g. And this is what we do not want to do. But it's tricky. And I actually think it's even trickier today because we don't even call them gods anymore, these fake lowercase g gods but they're still out there. See, God is supposed to be our king, God with a capital G. God is supposed to reign over our lives. God is supposed to be our ultimate authority, the one in complete power. But we have a way of adopting little lowercase g gods. Anything that we would put on that throne Anything that we would give ultimate power, anything or anyone that we would allow to make decisions for us, we are making them gods with a lowercase g. Things like money, power, beauty, sex, reputation, all of these have the potential to be a little fake gods. Now, 
These things aren't bad in and of themselves. It's that they become bad when we make them gods, when we give them control, when we allow them to sit on the throne that God should be sitting on. Because money isn't bad. Money pays the rent. But money cannot quench the thirst of our souls. And beauty isn't bad. It's great to look at in art or in people, but beauty cannot quench the thirst of our souls. And sex isn't bad. Sex is God's gift, given a, a way for physical intimacy to match emotional intimacy in a couple. That's good. But sex can be distorted too, right? Sex cannot quench the thirst of our souls. None of these little fake pretend gods can do it. Only the eternal water that comes from God himself. So what we need to do is the opposite of what God's people did in Jeremiah. To turn away from these lowercase g gods and turn toward our God with a capital G. But it can be hard. And so we start by identifying the gods in our life, the lowercase g gods, to think about what has taken that seat of power in our lives, what is giving us, what is taking on more authority than it ought to have, and to put those things in their place. In verse 11, Jeremiah says, has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. The fake gods in our lives will not stand the test. They will not profit in terms of feeding our souls. So we need to put them in their place and turn from them and turn toward God. But turning toward God, there's a challenge in that as well. Now, on this case, I'm preaching to the choir, preaching to the choir, because you are all here in church. And so you get it an hour out of your week to turn yourself to God. You're off to the good start. But this is just one hour out of all the hours in the week. And maybe we pray at night before we go to bed, but that's just a few minutes out of every day. And maybe you take time to read your Bible, but we can't walk around all day with our nose in the book like this. Eventually, we put the Bible down, and we might be tempted to turn away and turn toward those little gods. And those little gods, whew, they are attractive. They are appealing. What we need is 24-7 a way to keep ourselves focused on God. 24-7 to keep turning ourselves toward the source of pure, eternal living water. And the way we do that is by, again, doing what it seems Israel, God's people, had failed to do. In verse 6 of chapter 2, Jeremiah says, they did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness? This seems to imply that they have forgotten that God was the one who saved them from slavery in Egypt. And if you're an Israelite, this is the defining story. This is the big deal. This is God's saving act for the people of Israel, to save them from slavery out of Egypt. And if the Israelites have forgotten that story, they have forgotten God. Keeping ourselves focused, turned toward God, hinges on knowing the stories on remembering the story of our God, who created us in God's image, who made covenant with Abraham to reach out to all of us and bless all of us, who spoke to God's people through the prophets, who came to save us through Jesus Christ, who continued to work for us through the disciples and the early church and the church today. 
These and all the stories in between them, these are the stories of our God at work for us. These are the stories that we cannot forget. Because they're the stories that will keep us turned toward God. See, stories have a way of digging into our souls, of sticking with us, even after we've put the book down. Even after we've turned them off and stopped listening to them. Have you ever read a book, seen a movie, watched a TV show, and even after it was long done, you couldn't stop thinking about it? The story just carried with you? Recently, Alan and I watched um, a new show that's out on Netflix. It's called Stranger Things. It's really good. And after it was done, we finished it maybe two weeks ago, but I can't stop thinking about those middle school boys who are the main characters of the story, and what did they do next, and where did the story go from here? Because the stories stick with us, even when the book is put down. And what, what we are called to do is to remember the stories, to learn the stories in a way that they get a grip on our lives. If a book or a movie or a TV show has the power to do that, then how much more does the Word of God have the power to do that? So we as God's people, we dig into these stories. We start reading at Matthew, a chapter a day, and keep, keep reading through four accounts of Jesus Christ, through the, the Acts of the Apostles, through uh, the early church. And then when we're done with that, we wrap that around to the very beginning to read about God's love for us and the creation. But we don't stop there. We read it individually, but we read it together too. We read it here in church or in Sunday school or in Bible study. And eventually, we know these stories so well that we can't help but tell them. We tell them to our kids before they go to bed at night. We tell them to each other when we need comfort or wisdom. We tell them and retell them, and we allow them to get a grip on our souls. And those stories stay with us. When I was a kid, I confess that I used the Bible, forgive the analogy, almost like a Ouija board. If I was having trouble, say there was some boy at school that I liked and he didn't like me back, I'd open the Bible at random and point to a verse and see what it might say. Not always applicable. <laughs> then later I learned to use the concordance and I would flip to the back and look up the word love and see what the Bible had to say about that. Now, those ways of using the Bible, they're not without merit. Sometimes they really speak to us. But as I've gotten more mature in my faith, I've learned that what really helps is just knowing the stories. So that they sit in my soul. So that every day, all day, 24-7, they give me direction. And they keep me turning toward God. And eventually, those same stories... <coughs> They change us. Sometimes we have stories we have to keep telling because they're so important, we have to remember them and let them change us. And today, on 9-11, we remember stories that we've been telling for the last 15 years. Many of you know exactly where you were when you first got the news and exactly how you felt when it happened. We've told and retold as a culture stories of great tragedy and great bravery from that day. And we tell and retell them because we are changed by them and we want to be changed by them. Because if we ever face that kind of danger, we want to be brave too. Because we want to do whatever we can to prevent something like that from happening. Because we want to make the world more about love than about that kind of change. And so we tell and retell those stories so that they will change us. And if that is true about an event in our recent history, how much more is it true about the stories between our God and us contained in the Bible? So friends, my hope for us 
is that more and more all the time, we are a people who are turned toward God. Turned toward God by these stories. That we are learning together. That we allow them to be our story. Because this, this is the only water that will quench our souls. No little 